So, I am Dr. Nate Bosch, and I'm an environmental science professor at Grace College. And um, I want to start by praying for our time here this morning together, and then I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Dr. Don Young, and then he'll give us a little uh, preview on what we're going to talk about the next three days. Uh, so, dear Father, thank you so much for your wonderful creation. Uh, we thank you for summertime here in Indiana, and uh, we thank you for uh, the greenery around us. We thank you for the water, for the sky, uh, such an amazing creation. We want to talk about that this morning and over the next few days, and so I just thank you for that. I pray that each of us would leave here uh, understanding a little bit more how we can help take care of that creation that you've made, and, uh, and just be inspired by it as well in your wisdom and uh, your care even for us of this really amazing creation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, good morning, guys. Thanks for choosing the best coverage back to all here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're the science guys from Grace College up the road there in the Lone Lake. I have to be here uh, this week. Uh, my name is Don Young. I'm at Grace. Uh, I teach uh, math and physics. Astronomy and geology and a few other things as well. This whole area of bio and science is just a wonderful uh, career that we have. So uh, this morning, uh, uh, we're going to start off, and uh, we're also uh, going to be around uh, tomorrow and the next day as well. We've got a little outline here. And by the way, these three topics are completely independent. So uh, you're welcome to move on to a different power track on Thursday and Friday, or you can stay right here with us. That's, uh, that's your choice. But, uh, these three are kind of unconnected, so uh, uh, you, can, you can come and go. So uh, our plan is uh, today we're going to talk about uh, climate change and we'll hear about that in school and on the news. Kind of give kind of a balanced view of that. Then uh, tomorrow, if you are with us, uh, just some uh, ideas of just what is this idea of creation, biblical creation. Does that still make sense or is that something outdated from centuries ago? Of course, it does make sense. It's a refreshing way to look at this book around us. So we'll talk about creation in the book of Genesis. Then if I uh, stick around on Friday morning, that'll be a, a last power track. We're going to talk about Noah's Day and uh, the Great Flood. Uh, what do you think about that flood? Did it take place in Indiana? Was it worldwide? It was. And there's evidence all around us and it uh, changed the world. That's an important topic. So uh, all these different areas of Bible and science. And if we can, around the sides, we'll fit in talking about uh, fossils and dinosaurs and uh, everything else as well. Now, I don't know if you guys uh, are interested in science. Uh, we're taking that in class. And uh, you might have some questions about uh, this whole area of um, evolution and the whole story. And in case you do have any questions that we don't get, I brought a bunch of uh, four by six cards. And I'm just going to kind of put these in front of the table and you can maybe uh, pass them along. And if you have a question that you can jot down for something you've been wondering, ask uh, the science guys about this. And we'll work on this in the next couple of days and try to come up with an answer. So if you have any questions, jot it down and send them to the end. We'll pick them up at the end of our session today. And then we would hit those at the next couple of days. So that's the plan. So did I explain that? Independent talks here. Hope you stay with us all three days, but it's your choice. So many good things going on around here. And so uh, we're going to fire up. Time is going by here this morning already. This whole idea of climate change. Aren't they cute, those polar bears? And so uh, it's everywhere, and it's got people talking about it. So again, we want to kind of provide a balanced view of this whole idea of uh, what's going on in this world when it comes to the weather. And uh, Dr. Bosch and I are going to kind of go back and forth all three days as we're talking about things. We work well together. And uh, Nate's going to start us off this morning, so uh, good, good to have you here. All right, so climate change is a time to panic. First, we need to first we need to think about what is climate change. So we're not talking about the weather this past winter. We're not talking about the really warm temperature we have outside this week. Climate change is a directional change over a longer period of time. So at least three decades. Some scientists now are starting to look at just two decades, just 20 years instead. But you have to see averages over long periods to be able to say climate's changing. It's not enough for someone to say, hey, this past winter it was really warm. See, look, climate's changing, all right? You know, we gotta look over multiple years. So we do see significant climate change even when we use the correct um, definition up here. Surface temperatures 
have increased uh, just less than one degree Celsius between 1880 and 2012. So we might make that a whole lot, but it's already having some pretty significant impacts around the world. So this graph here, this shows, I know, I know this is uh, sort of relatively early in the morning for some of us, uh, but we're gonna show some graphs here. So this is called temperature anomaly, which just basically says sort of relative temperature across the globe, how's that changing? And you can see here our reference point is zero, uh, and we go below that and above that, and then 1850 marching forward to present. And you can see here scattering of temperatures, uh, mostly sort of uh, summer, winter sorts of things, but you can see there is an increase there. So what sort of impact is that having? Now these are all scientific studies over the last several years which are showing measurable impacts in how climate is impacting things. So retreat of mountain glaciers, so we can see that even in the United States in a lot of our national parks, we can actually measure glaciers receding uh, back to higher elevations. The thinning of the polar ice caps, this is one that sort of makes some news in sensational ways, you know, like we showed a picture of the polar bears and stuff, and the polar bears don't have any ice anymore, um, sort of a, a sensational view. Melting permafrost, anybody know what permafrost is? Yeah? Soil that's permanently frozen. So this is up in northern latitudes, okay? Uh, tundra sorts of areas. So we're seeing that permanently frozen ground is starting to melt. It's no longer permanently frozen, or less of it is permanently frozen. A 19 centimeter rise in sea level since 1900, so a lot of coastal communities are seeing the impacts of this. Earlier migrations of birds, um, folks who are uh, ornithologists and who study bird migrations and the timing of those are noticing that this is happening earlier now. Earlier leaf out of vegetation, so this is just when uh, vegetation, you know, maple and oak trees first start to pop that initial flourish of leaves in the springtime, that's happening earlier. And then changing species, geographic distribution, just where do you see certain animals or plants living, the geographic distribution of where they can survive is changing. And uh, Don's going to have a great example of that coming up here in a little bit. All right. I think probably the biggest potential issue with climate change, though, is not these widespread things, but it's that it's not consistent. So some regions have a greater warming, and others have a less warming, and some are actually getting cooler. So it's not consistent around the globe, and so it's causing more problems in certain areas than it is in others. And so it's unequal in its distribution across the globe. Precipitation, that's why we no longer call it global warming. Global warming, that sort of terminology not really used so much anymore because we know it's not just temperature. Temperature and all of these earth cycles also influence precipitation. And so precipitation is included in that. That's why we talk about climate change now. Um, and then one that I'm particularly interested in, in some of the areas of research that I work in is um, increasing frequency of extreme weather. So I'm a lake scientist. And I'm always looking at what's washing into lakes from the land. So maybe there's agricultural inputs washing in or people's yards or things coming off streets or parking lots and impacting local lakes. If we have more extreme events, more thunderstorms, those sorts of things, they're going to wash a lot more stuff into lakes that we don't want to see in the lakes. And so this one in particular um, is influencing some of the research that I'm involved with. All right, well, let's look. Since we're talking about the globe, let's look at a map of the whole globe. All right, so we've got some pretty colors here. This is surface temperature change from 1901 through 2012. The cooler colors here, the blue colors, are actually areas that have gotten cooler over that about a 100-year time period. And then the warmer colors on up to purple, those are the areas that have gotten measurably warmer over the last about 100 years. And so you can scan across here. Here where we are in Indiana, we're sort of in this really light sort of salmon color here, really light orange. And so you can see we just have a very slight warming. All the way on up to the purple areas, Siberia and Russia is that purple area. We've got some areas on uh, Ontario, Canada here and further up in Canada. We've got some areas down here in Brazil, um, some areas um, in Africa, kind of around the edge of the Saharan Desert there. So 
Uh, and then we've got other areas that have actually gotten cooler. The North Atlantic up here um, has gotten cooler. This is sort of interesting to me. I don't know if any of you have seen that movie, The Day After Tomorrow. That whole sort of catastrophic sort of, I mean, that's way overblown, so don't be worried about that happening. But um, what, what was interesting in that movie is it's talking about the North Atlantic circulation and how there's this issue there. And, and that's interesting that, that we actually see that in the data, the North Atlantic having some cooler areas. And then you can see even closer to home down uh, in the United States, uh, we have some areas that are getting cooler. Well, I said it's not just temperature, it's also precipitation. So here's a picture of precipitation. So here we got the brown colors. As you would expect, those are areas that are getting less precipitation on an annual basis. And then the bluer colors, those are areas that are getting more precipitation. So this is both rain and snow. So we're looking at everything together. You can see area here in the Midwest, close to home here, we've got more precipitation. So you might say, hey, what's the problem with this climate change stuff? We're, we've got even more water. Farmers are happy. The lakes and streams are all filled up well. Well, but we need to think across the globe and what's happening around the globe. You notice a lot of areas of uh, Africa here uh, in the dark brown. So much areas which may not get a lot of rain already as it is and now getting even less rain. We can see parts of um, Europe here out across uh, over there. We can see some scattered areas uh, through, through Mexico and into South America as well. So unequal across the globe. All right, so what's causing this? Well, I think you guys have all seen in your classes up until this point this greenhouse effect. So I think the best example of this every day would be getting into a hot car after it's been parked in the sun for a while, right? So you have light energy which comes in through the windows, but the heat energy gets trapped in and it can't get out, so the car gets really, really hot. Okay, same thing's happening around the globe. We've got an atmosphere around the Earth's surface, and so the light energy comes in from the sun, but then it gets changed over to heat, and the heat gets held in by that atmosphere, and so it slowly warms up. And so our greenhouse gases then, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, those are gonna be our uh, greenhouse gases. People often like to think or, or and wonder about, okay, so if climate change is happening, how much of it is due to people, right? And so here's, here's an interesting thing that we can look at that. So here's those major greenhouse gases here. And you can see here over time, over the last 2,000 years, and we can look at um, what the concentrations of these gases are in the atmosphere. And you can see relatively consistent here. And then since the Industrial Revolution, um, the industri industrial revolution, then we can see the spikes in all of these. So we, every time we burn something, it's carbon dioxide going up. Every time, um, oftentimes power plants and, and cars as well with nitrous oxide, methane. All of this is from livestock production. Um, you know, we love eating hamburgers, um, and I do too. And so all this livestock around the world, a much higher level than than what uh, our world has seen. In the past. So. These things are all uh, boosting up. All right, so Don's going to take us through uh, a little bit of a uh, biblical perspective on uh, climate change and even evidence we can see in the Bible of the changing climate. Okay, thank you, Dave. Boy, this starts on like your science class. No quizzes, no tests. We're just kind of enjoying this uh, good uh, summer, summer week. By the way, are you coming up with some questions? Remember Bible science stuff? Are there aliens? I didn't know we'd get all those animals on the ark. Not that we have all the answers, but again, if you have any questions, if you won't be able to get into anything, I'm going to pass some cards around. You're welcome to put more than one question on the card if you want. And uh, if we don't get any uh, right here, we, we got plenty to talk about, but let me pass these cards around. Just in case you have any questions, pull them around about politics, Bible science, we'll do our best. So anyway, there comes some uh, cards to look at. So yeah, we're carrying on here talking about uh, climate change on uh, this morning. And on this uh, page, it looks like we got a little bit of history. Let's think about um, world history in short order here on, on one slide. And uh, so I have three different parts to this. I have the pre-flood world. Now that would be the time from Adam to Noah, about 1,500 years. Then I asked, uh, in um, the flood that uh, 
episode that changed the whole world. That's going to be our talk on Friday. And then I have the post-flood world. That would be from Noah till you, till today. And just think about these uh, three broad areas here, the pre-flood worlds. If you think about the weather and climate this morning, those were the days, the pre-flood world. The whole place was warm and tropical and garden of heat blood. In the pre-flood world, during those days of the Old Testament patriarchs, there were no tornadoes or hurricanes. There were no glaciers or deserts. The whole world was almost like uh, warm and paradise-like. And uh, uh, that, day, that day didn't uh, last all that long, but the pre-flood world. Of course, people had turned their back on God. The world went crazy, and it came time to uh, clean up the place with the flood. And when God judges this world, he did a pretty thorough job. So all it came the Genesis flood, Noah's Ark, that whole story. Then we have where we are today, the post-flood world. That's about 4,500 years since the flood. And uh, the world has never uh, quite got as warm as it was in the early days, but it's the world we live in. And I added one more phrase at the bottom of this slide, the ice age. You say, there you go, Dion. Now you're going to become evolutionary, an ice age millions of years ago. But not at all. There is evidence that the Earth did have an ice age, but it was just yesterday. It was in the years following the flood. We even think we know what triggered it. But anyway, uh, just think about it on this uh, biblical history of climate. Let me think about the Ice Age a little bit more with you. I'm not talking about the movie. Boy, how many versions have there been now of Ice Age? But, uh, you know, the real world wide one. And uh, it's an interesting time in uh, history. And actually, what happened is at the time of the flood, the world's climate was thrown out of balance. And it took some centuries for it to recover. And in the centuries following the flood, it did get cooler. Not that the whole place was frozen up, but the temperature dropped, and it did trigger an ice age. And by the way, uh, this ice I'm talking about, where was it? Here's a page right out of a geology book. So wherever you live, were you under the ice? And you see how it's coming down from Canada there? There was lots of precipitation in the centuries following the flood, and the snow piled up up there in Canada. And uh, when it gets thick enough, it turns to ice, and it had a flow like pancake batter, and it came down across North America. I put a star about where Mary is. I think we would, we would be under the ice here at that time. If there were any Indians around, they would have to get out, out, of, out of this place. That's an interesting boundary where they think as far as the um, ice got. Uh, even Indiana is partly under the ice and partly not. And you can tell that because you can see where Indiana goes from smooth to bumpy. This moving ice was like a bulldozer. It leveled everything in its path, and that's why we have flatlands around here, around Marion, good farm country, but not a lot of you know, topography. But uh, the far south of uh, Indiana is more hilly, more bluffs, where the ice didn't quite reach. Anyway, still refining those kind of pictures, but uh, the ice was uh, something uh, like that. By the way, the point that I'd kind of like to make this whole talk uh, here this morning, this sharing with you, is that, in my view, the world's climate is always changing. So we're reading in the news about climate change as if it's the end of the world, time to panic. No, it's always adjusting itself. And uh, God cares for it all. But uh, in fact, uh, oh, here's my complicated graph. So it's a good thing that we're not uh, quizzing over this. But uh, let me just take a quick look at this. This is my homemade picture. Just look at the heavy blue line. That was my sketch of what is happening to the world's annual temperature. Sort of an average. That's even hard to get. Thermometers all over the planet and average them together. So uh, look at how that blue line goes along. It's got a couple of dips in it. Notice that? That's my view of uh, biblical history and what the temperature's done. So anyway, back here in the early days, remember it was warm and tropical? So it's kind of above average, probably about six degrees warmer than it is today all over the planet. Uh, again, that was the time. People even lived a long time then. They lived for centuries. That was a whole different world. Well, along comes the flood, right here someplace, and then the bottom falls out. Again, the world's climate was thrown out of balance and uh, got colder, especially in both polar areas. It probably dropped down about six degrees below average, and that's all that makes the trigger in ice age. By the way, the geologists know that there was an ice age, but they don't know what caused it. We think somehow it was connected with this whole flood um, um, history. Well, sooner or later, the uh, temperature started to recover, so the line comes back up. Although it never gets quite as warm as it was back there at the beginning, going along here. And uh, well, there's another little blip there, uh, looks like that's uh, like the pioneer times, long about 
13, 14, 1500. That's called the Little Ice Age. It wasn't the big one, but uh, there's been that one as well. That's either due to uh, volcanoes or a number of reasons. But again, that's my view that the climate is always adjusting itself, always changing. By the way, do you believe what I'm saying? Do you think there really was an Ice Age? Well, if there was, does the Bible say anything about it? You know, it doesn't really dwell on the, on the weather and climate. It's more of the important things like the gospel and history. But I think the Bible does touch on this uh, colder period after the flood. Let me show you what I'm thinking. Way back in the Old Testament, we have uh, this uh, man by the name of Job, J-O-B. Now, did Job live before the flood or after the flood? You say, I don't know. I don't want to answer questions here. This early in the morning. Well, he's living after the flood. He's post-flood. And if you read the book of Job carefully, there are lots of verses that talk about coal and ice or snow. By the way, I don't know whose dog this is. I just like dog pictures. Maybe that's your dog. So here's Job 38, 22. Have you entered into the treasures of the snow? A few other places in scripture it talks about snow, but doesn't Job. And uh, Job also talks about the cold wind and water turning to ice. I believe that Job was living during the ice age. Not that he had to have snow boots on there. He didn't really get that cold and icy in the Middle East where he was, but it was a colder period. So we just see these hints in the book of Job about this, this colder time as uh, the earth was uh, adjusting itself from the flood episode. By the way, let me say just a little bit more about this whole idea of climate change. Uh, Dr. Bosch showed you some graphs, and uh, here's just another way to look at it. Wow, these are complicated. Again, you look at the heavy blue line. That's the average world temperature as the years have gone by. We've got 100 years of data here. And all the other black lines in the red part there, those are error bars. Kind of hard to narrow this down. But I do say it looks like a trend that the temperature has uh, what's below average back here in the back in the 1900s, remember the 1900s, and uh, toward the right end there, the temperature's a little bit above average. And so uh, the climate may well be changing. Uh, Nate and I are not the climate change deniers. The reasons for it are another question, but it does seem to be adjusting itself and going up a little bit on the far right. Anyway, I'm looking at this graph, and I'll tell you what really impresses me with it, how little the temperature changes. Now, you know, you always got to see what's really being graphed here, what the numbers are, and that's on the side here. It looks like over here we were about uh, a half a degree below average. A half a degree. Now, that's centigrade, so that's maybe one and a half Fahrenheit. Then on the far right, where we're up here, we're about a half a degree above average. This is what impresses me, how little the temperature actually changes. During uh, my lifetime, the population of planet Earth has doubled. Yeah, back in the 60s, we had uh, three and a half billion people. Now we have over seven billion people. This world's taken off. So many more people. And in all the you know, cars and the fire, fires and everything that happens, and yet the temperature of the Earth hardly budges. I think this shows us the integrity, the strength that God's built into this world and, uh, and that it can put up with uh, the population and the temperature hardly changes. There's a lot of feedback mechanisms to hold the temperature constant. Not that we want to ignore this stuff and turn our back on climate change. There are things to do, but it's not uh, doomsday, and uh, I can just see uh, how this is put together for our well-being. Now, even that uh, half a degree or so temperature increase uh, over on the far right, there are implications of that. Things are happening. Let me show you one I read recently in the news. What is this critter here? What is that? Oh, it's a, it's a banded armadillo. We even got the, the details here. That's kind of a cute character. Now, aren't they big down the Texas way? Well, I wanted to tell you that due to climate change, they're coming our direction. And so this is an article they just read that uh, here come the armadillos. They need a warmer temperature, but they, they can spread out and they can handle it. So anyway, you can't see this too well, but this bottom line is their traditional uh, location. And uh, then it goes up on the white line. In fact, all those little dots are where they've been spotting them lately. I don't think they've reached Marion yet, northern Indiana, but they're in the southern part of the state. And uh, interesting uh, how that goes. So if it is really getting warmer, this is uh, you know increasing their habitat. So great, we're going to have one more thing to watch for on the road. 
I don't think armadillos are too smart. You, know? you have to watch out for these critters. So uh, there they are. They're not dangerous, are they? I'm not that familiar with armadillos. Okay, so they'll be a good pet. They'll be in your backyard like a squirrel. Here they come. Locations for me. Yeah, armadillos. By the way, we detect a couple reasons why uh, the, uh, the temperature of the earth might be going up just a tad. All these graphs, you know, this is kind of where we work in the science world. This is an interesting one. This kind of shows the increase of um, CO2, carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere. And you can see how that thing's been going up. Now it's still down in the parts per million, but it's above 400 parts per million now. And so here we have several decades of data. Uh, see, this is um, a, a greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide traps the warmth of the Earth. So when that goes up, that might be a reason why the temperature is uh, going up. That's an interesting graph. It's going up. They measure this out in Hawaii, where the air is the clearest where they measure this carbon dioxide. And there's even a zigzag in this curve. Is some, couldn't they draw very well or what? Why does that kind of jump every year? You see, you know, up and down, sort of like a sawtooth. Well, what we're watching is the earth breathe. When the trees are in full bloom, they soak up the CO2, and then it drops down a little bit. And then when the trees go dormant, then it starts to increase. So did I say the earth breathing? At least the vegetation, they're that fine-tuned that they can uh, watch this happening. Kind of a cool structure to this curve. And by the way, how does that work? Isn't it like the northern and the southern hemisphere? When some of the trees are dormant, aren't the other ones blooming? Shouldn't that cancel out? Where are the trees on planet Earth? Most of them are up here north of the equator. If you look at the globe of the Earth, below the equator is mostly water. So this zigzag is being controlled by trees in the northern hemisphere, trees in Indiana. Anyway, they measure that pretty carefully. So that's one thing that could be uh, adjusting the temperature somewhat. And again, we're not even sure exactly you know, why this is going up, whether it's, I'm sure some of it is man-made, and some of it maybe ocean things going on or whatever. So that's one uh, indication we have for uh, global warming and uh, our temperature change. And then I should also mention the sun. Now, here's a picture of the sun taken through some kind of a filter. Can you see the freckles on it? As we study the sun carefully, we can see that it has sun spots. And uh, that's what those things are. Of course, you can't look directly at the sun, but uh, there are ways to get it to show up. And uh, these sun spots kind of uh, come and go. They last a few weeks. And uh, those are areas of disturbance. Uh, they have to do with the magnetic field of the Earth. And these are of great interest in astronomy. We're not sure why, but these sunspots, they, they wax and they wane. They show up a whole lot of them, and then they die out, and then they come back again with an 11-year cycle. Wow, the sun is complicated doing that. And so they've been watching this thing for, uh, for centuries, actually. There were lots of graphs at you. And so uh, this is the sunspot cycle. When the peak goes up, there are more sunspots, and it goes down. It's about like 11 years between each of those peaks. So that's carefully watched. But then there's something interesting that happens. Way back here in the 1600s and 1700s, for some reason, the sunspots went away. They were measuring them, but they just died out. And they called it the Bonder Minimum. That's the name of some astronomer. And uh, what happened to the planet when the sunspots went away? You know? That was the little ice age. It got cooler. Somehow these sunspots are also controlling the Earth's climate. And so this was a cooler period. And when I look on the far right, I don't know if you can see this as well, but astronomers are quite concerned about this, how that graph seems to be dropping down. There are some indications that the sun is once again going into a quiet phase, and the sunspots are going away. And if that happens, then we get another little ice age which might cancel out a warming temperature. There are so many factors crossing over each other here. But anyway, I just wanted to mention those two, CO2 and uh, sunspots that in a major way uh, control the Earth's climate. Anyway, I don't know how many sunspots there are out there today, but uh, some of us kind of watch those and keep an eye on them. By the way, a little trivia point. Something special is happening to the sun here uh, one month from now. Are you following this? What is it? A total solar eclipse. Now, it's not coming through this part of Indiana. You've got to go down to Kentucky or up to Nebraska. It sweeps across the country. I hope some of you will be on the path for that. This is the first time we've had an eclipse sweep all the way across the country in 100 years. 
So uh, you'll hear more about this uh, August 21. It's going to be a big deal. And if you miss it, when they do finally come, they come in pairs. So there'll be another one seven years from now, and that's going to come closer to wherever we'll be for momentum. So uh, just a great time to be living with you, watching sunspots, things that really end up and uh, uh, eclipses, God controls all that stuff. Anyway, that was a couple effects of uh, climate change, the uh, CO2 and sunspots. We're going to be wrapping up here pretty quickly. Uh, Nate, give us a little bit more about uh, what we should think about uh, climate change. Yeah, so just in closing here, Don and I each have a slide to go through on kind of uh, what would a balanced view for us Christians be to look at climate change. All right, so first off, most would agree that climate change is occurring. I mean, I would say this is in the high 90s uh, as far as percentages of people who have looked at this and studied this. Uh, and Don and I would both agree with this as well, that the climate is indeed changing. Most climatologists predict a substantial climate change in the next 50 to 100 years, and they would attribute this mostly to human actions. That's maybe where we start to uh, wonder a little bit, and there's some uncertainty. How much of it is due to human actions? And because of the complicated nature of this, I don't know if we'll ever know that for sure. Uh, but we do, we do think that it's partially due to human activities. We're just not sure what what percentage, maybe. So some skeptics would question whether it's primarily caused by humankind. Um, do we really know the climate system well enough to make future predictions? There's there's many climatologists, and I've worked with some on some uh, joint research projects, that they um, their whole career is spent looking at climate, predicting future climate, and so they have sophisticated models which go in, in, into the future, uh, but there's uncertainty with those models. Um, and then, do we really need to reduce fossil fuels now? This kind of gets into more of a political sort of a thing where we're thinking about, okay, now this is what we know. What does that mean for policy in our country or other countries around the world? Um, and there's a lot of good debate in that. And in some of my classes on campus, we, uh, we do debate and talk about that a little bit more in depth. So, but what should our response as Christians be? Well. This, this is a whole environmental ethics class that I teach at Grace College, all just into this one little section of the slide here. So uh, God owns it. God owns his creation. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. It's not the earth was the Lord's and then he gave it to humans. Okay? The earth is the Lord's. Uh, he sustains it. Lots of verses. Psalm 104 is a great one that talks all about how God sustains his creation actively. Even in some of the examples Don was talking about with climate, uh, even now with relatively little variation. And God values his creation. He created it. Um, he had Adam go through and name the animals and give value to them. He saved all those different kinds on the ark. He values his creation for sure. What are we to do then? We're to use it. We're also to care for it. And we can love others in how we care for it. Remember how we had talked about that climate change is not equal all around the world? We can love people on the other side of the world by being careful how we live here in the United States. Because climate change is impacting certain parts of the world even more than it is here. So uh, our attitude then um, should be one of unselfishness and humility, contentment with uh, basic necessities in life. And um, when we're living the way God wants us to, by taking care of his creation, it is a wonderful witness to other people. I cannot tell you how many opportunities I have as um, an environmental scientist to talk to people and they say, to non-Christians, and they say, what? You're a Christian, but you actually care about the environment? This doesn't make sense. Normally Christians don't care about the environment, and it's a wonderful witnessing opportunity when people see us as Christians actually doing what the Bible says, which is taking care of God's creation, and it's a great segue for good conversations. All right, Don, let's hear a summary from you as well. Okay, thank you, Nate. You know, I've been in this business for a while, of uh, being a college prof and uh, watching uh, current events in science, and I've noticed a trend. There's kind of like a worry of the year. When that comes along, it says that this is going to be the end of the world and we must do things drastically. So I started a list of things over the decades that have really shaken people up. And I'm just doing this to 
find a little balance. I mean, you're living in high school during this time of uh, climate change. I'm wondering if this is the first time ever, but uh, this list goes on. Acid rain, what you're going to do with nuclear waste. Then these things get taken care of and they go away and the next one comes along. By the way, the last one I got on the list there, population explosion. Just a few years ago, they were saying you can't have kids because there's too many people in the world. Uh, you know what's happening to the population today in the world? It seems to be going down. Some countries are wondering what to do about this. So things it, have changed so rapidly. So anyway, just to provide a little balance. Not that you turn your back on these issues, but maybe not quite as desperate as, uh, as they sometimes say. And just as a little bit of encouragement, uh, here's a verse over in the book of Genesis, chapter 8, verse 22, which assures us that the seasons are going to keep on going. It's not that uh, climate change is going to ruin the whole place and bring down humanity. As long as Earth and Earth, God controls the seasons, summer and winter, good old summertime going outside today, and uh, that will continue. Of course, the present and the future are in God's hands. And by the way, when you're thinking about climate change, uh, and I mentioned it's always changing, there are some interesting times coming up. And so here are just some end time events, which would be a whole separate talk, but it's kind of interesting. The book of Revelation talks about the final days when the earth gets wrapped up, and uh, that will be a, a fearful time. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, talks about a time when the sun will be darkened. Now that sounds like global cooling. That sounds like that would bring on an ice age. That'd be a scary time for people. Then a few chapters later in Revelation 16, 8, it says that the sun will be brightened and the heat will burn people. That's going to be a severe global warming. So this kind of thing uh, will happen. It's in God's hand. That's an end time uh, uh, event. And I want to be on the Lord's side so that I'm out of the way and not worried about that kind of thing. But uh, God controls in every temperature degree that we see future sun activity uh, all, in, all in God's hands. Hey, we're out of time here. We want you guys to get out early for um, uh, the, the main session. And by the way, if you can join us tomorrow, let's talk to creation. We'll see you then if you can come. If you did a lot of questions, let's keep it behind. Thanks for coming today. Have a great day, Alabama.